Hello everyone and welcome to the Foreman Community Demo. If you have any question, you know we are on the IRC and Freenode on Twitter and on Discord. So, last week we had a booth at DevConf Berno, and this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, we will be at FOSDEM conference in Brussels. We will have a booth there at Building K, Level 2, one floor up from where we were in the last several years. We will also have a few talks in the info room. Next, Monday to Wednesday, we will be continuing to conflict management camp in Ghent. We will have a booth and a formal room. On Tuesday, you will see pulp talk in the same room for those that are interested. As usual, we will have a community dinner and the formal hack day on Wednesday. All the details are on the discourse and at our booth. Come, say hi, and get some cool swags. The community survey is publicly out. Please help us to help us help you and fill the survey. Um, this will help to shape the future of the project. So today we are going to have an interesting demo. First, we'll talk about Pulp3 YAM indexing and Pulp3 backup and restore. Pulp3 form and debug and a new way of deploying DynaFlow. So first, with Jan, you will speak about Pulp3 YAM indexing and Pulp3 backup restore. How are you, Jan? Hello, I'm good. Thank you very much. All right, I'm just making sure my screen is shared and we should be good. Okay, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian. I work on a lot of the Pulp3 related stuff for Catello, and I just have a couple of updates for you all today. So firstly, at one of the last community demos, I showed um, yum repo type syncing, and now we have indexing working. So I'll just quickly show off. I have a, a CentOS 7 repository synced here using Pulp3. You can see the upstream URL here. And just going down to the content, you see I have about 10K packages and 88 package groups. So I'll just quickly do a little query to the Pulp3 API to show where that content is coming from. So I'm just using the uh, repository version URL here. Show you some info. So here's a bunch of data. You can see it brought back the RPM packages here. You see about, you see the same number, 10,097. And then if I scroll up a bit, you'll also see the RPM package groups. So what's great is that now you'll be able to index your content. And uh, the next thing we'll be working on uh, Hopefully soon will be content view support. Okay, so that's not the only Pulp3 thing I have to share. So another thing that I've worked on is uh, online backup, or sorry, backup and restore uh, with form and maintain in Pulp3. So this includes online backup, offline backup, and restore to both online and offline backups. So I, it's too slow to show you in person, but I'll just show some photos. So firstly, we have um, an online backup here. You can see it checks if the Pulp Core database is up, which of course is Postgres. And then afterwards, we continue on. You can see I've circled here. It's backing up the Pulp Core database online. So you'll see that if you do an online backup. And then for offline backup, it, it says it's already done because it backs it up with the rest of the Postgres data. And then with restore, it's just like any restore. You can see it restores from the pull core dump using the online backup, and then it migrates the pull core database. And then finally, you can also, well, that was supposed to say restore after offline backup. But anyway, you can see it extracts the files and then migrates the pull core database again. So now using foreign maintain, you're able to backup and restore your pulp3 database as well as your everything else that you would back up before. So, yep, that's just it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. That was very useful. Okay, next up, we'll have Samir talking about Pulp3 form and debug. To you, Samir. Thanks, Alvi. Thanks, Alvi. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. 
So uh, I'm Samir and I work for the Ketelo team. Uh, today I'm going to run through some of the pulp three logs and details that we are now capturing with the form and debug tooling. So let's get to it. Uh, so here you can see I've already run the form and debug command on my VM and uh, a form and debug tar is created. And so let's uh, run through some of the files here. The application logs for pub3 are all logged in var log messages, which is being captured inside this directory. Uh, another few files of interest for us are some of the pub core related files. So I'll just open those. Uh, so we have a list of all the running and loading. Uh, pulp core services. So as you can see, we have all the required uh, pulp core related services loaded and running. Uh, also another file of interest is uh, the pulp core service files. So this one has all the unit files for our pulp core services that we are interested in. So we have the pulp core API service files, the worker, and the resource manager, etc. Uh, and another file of interest is the settings file, which is stored inside the logs as pulp settings.py. So this is the basic pulp tree configuration file. So we are also capturing this. Uh, Another file of interest here is the Pomen maintain service status. So, if I scroll up, there are also pulp three services which have now been added to the Pomen maintain service list. So, uh, just a minute. So you'll also see pulp core service details inside of the uh, Pomen maintain service status. And this is pretty much it for me today. Thanks everyone. And I'll hand it back to Avi. Thank you so much, Samir. So next up, we have Adam talking about a new way of deploying Dynaflow. Hello, Adam. Hello, Avi. Thank you for having me. Uh, today, I will start about new way. Uh, I will talk about the new way of deploying Dynflow, which is in form and nightly since uh, somewhere around last Wednesday. So let's get started. Uh, I will first go over the most simple way of deploying Dynflow, even though it's not stricter related to the changes, and that would be as a black box. It's just a small thing. It's a, it's its own service. You run it and it's there and it does things. But that's not the level of detail we want. We want to see what's going on and why we did the changes we did and what those were. So let's go one level deeper. Timeflow needs a database. So the simplest way is to let it have a built-in in-memory SQLite and that's actually what we do when we deploy Dynflow on the smart proxy. We just bolt on a REST API to this box and it sits there and it does work for us. This hasn't changed. This, this has been this way for some time. So we'll move more towards Foreman. In Foreman, the deployment usually looks like this. Uh, the database isn't internal. It's an external service now. And there are several clients, which usually are HTTPD threads, which are sending work to the executors through the database. But still, we don't know what the executor is, what's inside it. So let's take a look. Now, things are getting a bit more complex. Uh, in this sense, when I say executor, uh, you can imagine the Dynflow D service, as we're used to. Uh, it's a single process which under the hood contains many different things. 
I'll start in the top right corner with others. It contains so many things that it would take us an hour to go over all of them, but not all of them are important for us right now. So I just labeled them as others and we don't care about them anymore. Uh, the important part is here in the center, the one called orchestrator. It's not really a, a piece of code or something. It's more like an idea. It's a collection of several classes and modules. And it tells the workers what they should do. The trouble with the orchestrator is that it holds some local state. And also it relies on clock, which also has some kind of a local state, which is held only in the memory of the process. Then we have queues. In this example, we have the default queue and remote execution queue. And we have workers which consume events from the queues and perform work. The workers are connected to the database because they need to load data and so on. And we have foreman talking with the executor through the database. Uh, this was the setup we had for some time. And it kind of worked. But then we had issues with scaling, and we took several approaches to that. One was that we could spawn, we could have more workers inside the same process. The workers are implemented as threads, and if you know a bit Ruby, you know that threads in Ruby aren't exactly the best performing thing in the world. So it wasn't as good as we needed. You could spawn like, I don't know, 15 of these until you would see the diminishing returns. And so that got us thinking, what can we do? We can spawn the entire thing in several instances. So we took the entire executor and run another process just like it. Both of these processes contain the same things. Uh, they had the same workers, same configuration, but they were taking different jobs from the database. Again, it wasn't perfect. We, had, we hit an issue where the workers who actually do the heavy lifting uh, would hog memory. The entire process, because of the workers, would take more and more, and it never really gave it back to the operating system. And the only way to reclaim the memory was to kill the entire process. Trouble with that was that the process held many things in memory, the local state, the clock, the contents of the queues. And if you killed the process, you lost everything. And that made crash recovery incredibly hard because we didn't have the entire data to reconstruct the original state. So we figured that we couldn't really fix this with a small change. So we did some larger ones and split the executor into several processes. And we ended up with something like this. You can see that the orchestrator and the worker are different processes. They're separate, so that means we can restart the worker without you know, losing the local state, which is held only in the orchestrator part, which is good. We also don't lose the contents of the queues because they are stored in the Redis, which we added. So restarting workers and reclaiming memory becomes relatively safe. That's good. Uh, it also allow, allows us to do several other things. We can configure independently how many threads a single worker process should have before we couldn't do that. It would be for all executors configuration. Here we can we have much more granular control, so that, that's also nice. And just to go over the flow briefly, the client, foreman in this case, creates an execution plan, puts it into the database, and asks anyone to execute it. The orchestrator accepts it, splits the execution plan into steps, and puts the steps into the queues. Then the workers pick up the work items from the queues and execute them. And 
use the Danfo orchestrator queue to talk back to the orchestrator and tell it that this particular work item was done. Uh, how does it look on the system? We deploy the orchestrator and the worker as system using systemd template services. Uh, for those who don't know, it's the name will be Dynflow Sidekick add and then an instance identifier. The instance identifier has to match a file in slash etc slash format slash Dynflow, then the instance identifier dot yaml. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I will show you on a live machine how it looks. And now it's a similar image to the one we saw just a moment ago, but it shows how we can scale this thing out. We can deploy independent workers, which we couldn't do before, and we can dedicate workers to queues. So in this example, we have the worker one, which consumes events from the default queue and the remote execution queue. And then we have a worker two, which consumes only from the remote execution. So we can have a process dedicated to only remote execution or only default queue or both. And we can configure how many threads the worker process should. Now, this looks good on paper, but how would one do that on a live machine? Really simple. You just go to etc slash format slash downflow, and there are configurations for the orchestrator and worker. And if you have Catello, there's a worker for the host queue. And all you have to do is copy the configuration. Optionally, you can edit it to, you know, make it consume from other queues or have a different number of threads. And then you just enable the new instance of the template service. And you will get a fresh new worker and it will just work. The last thing I want to show, because this is something new, uh, in the past, we had the form and task service, and then we had DynflowD, but form and tasks was still symlinked as DynflowD, so it kind of worked. But now it's still there, but don't use it, please. Now all of these have been replaced by DynFlow sidekick at something. If you want to see all the DynFlow sidekick services, you can use wildcards. So for the status, you can use systemctl status downflow dash sidekick at asterisk. For combined logs from all the processes, you can use journal ctl dash u downflow dash sidekick at asterisk. And we also added a sidekick console into form and tasks so you can actually inspect the state in Redis. So I'll just quickly switch over to a terminal. This is my machine. So as I promised, the configuration lives in slash etc slash form and slash downflow. And we can see that there are three files, one for the orchestrator, one for the worker, and one for the host SKU. That means we have Catello installed on this machine. If we pick one, for example, the worker, we can see that it's configured to use five threads and to listen on the default and remote execution. Similarly, the host skew one only listens on the host queue. Okay, so let's do a simple scaling exercise. Uh, let's say we want to deploy another worker because the one we have just, you know, is swamped with work and we need to help it. So all, the simplest thing we can do is we can just create a symlink to the configuration. So now we have the worker and worker dash one, which has the same configuration as worker. And now that all that is left is to start it with CTL start, downflow dash sidekick at worker dash one. And if you look at the status, you can see it's up, it's live, and it's doing something. The last thing I will show you is the console as a debugging tool. So far, there is no button in the UI which would take you there because it's really a low level thing. So you have to know the URL to get there. It is the hostname slash foreman underscore tasks. 
And in here, you can see the number of memo sidekick jobs which were processed by the workers. You can inspect the processes. This one started just now is the worker one we just added. And you can inspect the queues, how many items are in there, and what's the latency. So that's that. All this is now in Foreman Nightly. Uh, I would like to thank Ivan Nechas for the original split and Andre for the changes he did to installer and also everyone involved because it makes me really happy to see what we accomplished. And that would be all from me. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Adam, for presenting that. That was really cool and looks like really useful. Um, and it's an essential change for the tasks. Really nice that finally you can scale up easily. So thanks. Um, so that's it for today's demo. Um, as always, we are available for any question. We, uh, we are welcome to talk with us about anything that you saw today and everything that you didn't saw today. Um, we are available on the IRC and YouTube and Twitter and Discord. Thank you for watching and take care.